Turn with me to Deuteronomy 4. Deuteronomy 4, verses 39 and 40. Moses says to fleshly Israel, Know therefore this day, and consider it in thine heart, that the Lord, he is God in heaven above, and upon the earth beneath, there is none else. Thou shalt keep therefore his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee this day, that it may go well with thee and with thy children after thee, and that thou mayest prolong thy days upon the earth which the Lord thy God giveth thee forever the Israelites of old the nation of Israel fleshly Israel was a type of the Lord's church spiritual Israel thus in the right division of the word 2 Timothy 2.15 we can help ourselves greatly today under the New Testament's authority in serving Christ as Christians to understand it better by those things were written in types and shadows and how God dealt with fleshly Israel, which is type of the church. God wanted his people to know their singular relationship with God. He also said to Moses in verse 29 of Deuteronomy 5, Oh, that there were such a heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. Of course, you know, if you're familiar with the Bible at all, that the children of Israel were in Egyptian bondage, they were at the mercy of the task masters, for they were slaves. But after witnessing God unleash ten plagues upon his people, then Pharaoh reluctantly let the Israelites depart out of Egypt. And of course, as you know the text, Pharaoh had a quick change of heart and the scripture says in Exodus 14, verses 6 and 7, that he readied 600 chosen chariots to pursue the Israelites. And then we read in Exodus 14, 10, And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians were marching after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. Now it was at this time that Moses, remember, a type of the Christ, that he told the people that the time was coming when they would never again see their Egyptian enemies. Exodus 14 and verse 13. Now, I would like to apply this, as I think it should be, to spiritual Israel, the church. Because we, as members of the Lord's body, can learn from this incident some great lessons that can help us be very faithful to God in all things. These are not difficult to understand. They're taught, in fact, in many, in various ways, in both the Old and New Testament, in other places, of course, than this. Well, one of the things is that, is that great changes may occur very quickly. That's the first point. And if we learn that, we will have begin to take a step in the right direction. Great changes may occur very quickly. The Egyptians were pressing the Israelites one moment, and the next moment, all of them were destroyed in the sea. To escape the Egyptians, 
The children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon dry ground. And the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. Exodus 14, verse 22. Now Paul will refer to this and say that they were all baptized in the cloud and the Moses, or unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So I know that that is a type of the person who is an alien sinner obeying the gospel and being baptized into Christ. Of course, Paul makes the application that once you become a Christian, you need to be faithful in all things because those people were baptized into Moses in the cloud and the sea. And then Paul says, but many of them God was not well pleased and he overthrew them in the wilderness. So when you're baptized into Christ, you're just starting. You're a babe in Christ. You're a new convert. Some will, of course, know more than others, but nevertheless, you're just starting to live the Christian life. You've been born of water and the Spirit. Notice, though, at this point in their deliverance from Egypt, that is fleshly Israel, that they're safe now. They've obeyed Moses. Their fears have been allayed. But remember, Pharaoh decided he would go through there too. Moses was told to stretch forth his hand over the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen, even all the host of Pharaoh that went in after them into the sea. There remained not so much as one of them. Exodus 14, verse 28. Let me say to you, if you're in your sins outside of Christ, not a Christian, lost and undone, separated from God, no hope of heaven, that if you don't repent of your sins and confess your faith in Christ and are baptized into Christ for the remission of sins, you will not be able to go through the waters of baptism and benefit from them. There must be full belief placed upon the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. True repentance, Acts 17, 30, and confession of one's faith before men, Romans 10, 10. Now you're qualified to be immersed in water by the authority of Christ in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission of sins. You're not qualified until you've gone through the first processes to get you to that point. Thus Pharaoh and his unbelieving people all died, for they were not qualified as Israel was to pass through the sea. And the waters came down. And it destroyed them. It also lets us know that God wipes out everything in a way of sin. Our alien sins. The sins that alienated us from God. When we're fully obedient from the heart to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Which is God's power to save us from sin. Romans 1.16 and Romans 6.17 and 18. But now more particularly back to this. The warning is, I think, clear that those who rebel against God had best be honest with themselves, God, and the truth of God's Word when they evaluate their lives. Now, the Hebrews writer records, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any one of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Then what is our duty one to another as brothers and sisters in Christ? But exhort one another daily, as long as it's called today. Lest any one of you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. We all know that sin is the transgression of the law, 1 John 3, 4. We all know that Satan gets us to sin by believing and obeying a lie. We become Christians by believing and obeying the truth. If you continue in my word, Jesus said, then are my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Father, Jesus prayed, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The word's the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8, 11. 
The Word is the sword of the Spirit, the instrument the Holy Spirit uses to convict us of sin, convert us to Christ, and to keep us faithful. It all comes back to the Word of God and our attitude toward it and our response to what it teaches. So the writer of Hebrews said we're to exhort one another daily, so long as it's called today, lest we be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. To believe a lie is to be deceived. I have a responsibility. God has placed upon me as a free moral agent and a rational intellectual creature with honesty or dishonesty, whichever way it might be, to approach the Word of God. Now, I can approach it honestly, or I can approach it dishonestly. It doesn't change the meaning of the Word. I wrote this in front of my Bible a long time ago because it came to mind when we studied the objectivity of truth and how it does not change or depend upon a person being male or female, old or young or sick or healthy or wealthy or not. And it's this. Truth is truth and will always be truth no matter anyone's ignorance of it or attitude toward it. It's just the way that it is. Sin may appear to be profitable, but such is far from the truth. The psalmist was perplexed at the wicked people's ability to prosper until he went into the sanctuary of God and considered their latter end. Here's what's said. Surely thou, sellest them, thou settest them in slippery places. Thou castest them down to destruction. Psalm 73, verses 17 and 18. The depiction of people who don't trust in God on the basis of His Word. Who just give lip service to God if they give anything. Who are disobedient to Him. Who love this present world as Paul said Demas did. For that's the reason he forsook Paul. They are set in slippery places. They may give you a picture of everything's alright. And just wonderful as they rebel against God and do as they please. But the Bible says they're not. One moment, all can appear to be well. And the next moment, that person will find his feet swept out from under him as he faces judgment. After all, the Bible's full of material to declare how brief life is and how quickly it passes. But our second point is this. Our opportunities may suddenly vanish. The Egyptians had witnessed the tremendous power of Almighty God declaring that what Moses said about Israel is from the only true and living God. The plagues were for the purpose of making believers of the Pharaoh and his people who himself, who thought of himself as a God, and so did the people. Instead of believing in the true, the one, the living God, and they had ample evidence to do so. The stubborn Egyptians rebelled against God, would not listen to Him. Now the Apostle Paul in the New Testament writing to us, that is Christians, said this, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, today is the day of salvation. 2 Corinthians 6, 2. Why quote that here? Well, remember our point is, is that our opportunities may suddenly vanish. How many of us put off what we should do right now to do it tomorrow? With no guarantee whatsoever that tomorrow will come. And we will intellectually admit I have no guarantee that tomorrow will come, but I'll still put it off till tomorrow or the next day or whatever knowing full well that these opportunities to do God's will pass. 
So many put off till tomorrow what they should do today. Knowing full well tomorrow may never come and someday it will not. And usually when we least expect it. The Apostle Paul to the Gentiles also made it clear that the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. And they're seen through our perception of the things that are made. And what is it? His everlasting power and Godhead. American Standard says His everlasting power and divinity. And thus he says of all men, they are without excuse. Romans 1.20. At one time, you know, all men believed in God. And then men departed from God. Read Romans chapter 1 and you'll see how it happened. Well, how many more opportunities will you have to straighten your life up? When we see people do things that are contrary to God's will, when we see people leave undone what God obligates them to do, when it has to do with their salvation, does it move us? Does it bother us? Or do we want to say, well, now let's just, let's just move on this tomorrow. What would you think if you had gospel preachers when meetings would be attended because people were closer to the Bible, interested in godly things, believe the Bible is the Word of God. And then the preacher urging people to become Christians says, we'll talk about it more next week or next month. Well, as far as I know, every faithful gospel preacher has urged people as soon as they know the truth and they're subject to it to act upon it. Why do we do that? Because we have no assurance for the next second. I had a friend whose grandfather was a member of the church, went through the worship. He sat over toward the back. It says, time to, read, uh, to lead the closing prayer. They stood up, sang the song. Then he had already been announced. He'd read the prayer, and nothing happened. And he stood there for a while. Until finally it became rather obvious something was right, and they looked around, and he was slumped over in the pew, dead. Now, of course, he got up that morning thinking, I'm going to get ready to leave the prayer, and uh, I'll die right there, didn't he? You just don't know. And we need to live as we do not know, not as we're going to have tomorrow, all too often in our families, in our individual workings, in the church, even in the planning of elders. We'll get together next week. And I always want to say, promise, you absolutely know, we'll get together next week. Well, I might say, yeah, we can be sure we'll get together next week, maybe at the judgment. <laughs> I wonder sometimes how far we are from the world and on that slippery slope that our Lord talked about it. How many more opportunities will you have to obey the gospel or as a child of God wherein you know you're doing or not doing things contrary to God's will? Will you keep on without doing God's will to gain forgiveness? Telling yourself you have tomorrow. That's believing a lie. Thus you're deceived thereby. You don't have anything but right now. Then the third point is that one's self-confidence can lead to ruin. Now, that's not to condemn all self-confidence. But it's to point out that you can be so solid with your own view of yourself that it can lead you astray. Remember, the Egyptians were so self-confident, they thought they'd go through right behind the Israelites. Just like the Israelites arrive on the other side and take care of these rebellious slaves. But they trusted only in their own fleshly strength. Only in their human wisdom. Well, you know, they had experienced all those plagues that were miracles and overthrew the gods of Egypt. Why didn't it tell them that the words of Moses was the words of God? Look what would have happened if they had paid attention to that first miracle that confirmed that Moses was telling them God's will about Israel. They could have thrown the might of the strongest nation on earth behind Israel. 
and escorted them out and provided them help and carried them over to the land of promise. They could have done that. But they didn't. As Pharaoh said, who is this God that I should obey him? Well, at the Red Sea, he found out. And so doing then as rebellious people who would not believe in God, who had no intent to obey him, they rushed into those waters to their own destruction. The Bible reminds all today to let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall, 1 Corinthians 10, 12. That's true of me, it's true of you, and everybody else. And of course he's writing to Christians, specifically in 1 Corinthians 10, 12. How often have we seen that kind of thing happen? And folks, I'm telling you for one, in my personal feelings, I'm tired of seeing people deceive themselves. The Bible emphatically teaches that the wages of sin is death. There's nothing else it's going to pay. Sin's the transgression of God's law. It's the only thing that can separate man from God. It's the only tool Satan has to get you to violate God's will. And we dare not let ourselves view things from our own fleshly perspective on anything. No matter how confident one might be in success, as the world, of course, defines success, and possibly even as the Bible defines spiritual success, that person is doomed to failure who do, does not choose to partake of the abundant life that Jesus spoke of in John 10, 10 by full obedience from the heart to the gospel and steadfast faithfulness to God, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. The fourth point, is that the separation between God's children and the children of the world, the children of the devil, listen, will one day be finalized forevermore. Every day we live, no matter how much you love the truth and how well you live it and no matter how much you're contending for the faith and no matter how much you're trying to reach the lost with the gospel, you're still having to associate with people who deny the existence of God, the deity of Christ, who deny the inspiration of the scriptures, who deny all sorts of principles of the Bible concerning how we're to live before God. They're going to be separated from us, and I'll never have to put up with that kind of stuff again. Do you ever just get sick of worldliness? I would love to be able to turn on the television. I would love to be able to go by a newsstand. I would love to be able to be in public and hear people visiting and not see and hear some of the awfulest stuff that's contrary to God's will coming out of their mouth and the way they're undressed. You know, it's said of righteous lot in the city of Sodom that the life carried on daily in that city, vexed his righteous spirit. Now the problem is with us, sometimes we get so used to it, we just let it pass away. We don't realize we're the salt of the earth and the light of the world. We don't realize we have an obligation individually to deal with people around us who are in error, outside of Christ, or even our own brethren who are in error. There's no excitement or fervency in it. There's no zeal. There's no urgency to get people to come to grips with their sins. Well, while I'm by no means complete in it, from the time I was 17 years old, and the reason I know that, I was a freshman in college, I lived in a dorm on a state campus. Now, that meant something then as to worldliness, but it means even more now. And I knew what I had to do. Nobody was out there to do what I had to do. And I made a few folks upset, but they didn't know what to do about it because nobody ever said that. I, you know one of the things to run the worldly people off, they're not going to change? Just keep inviting them to Bible study in church. You don't, have to, you don't have a whole lot of problem with them if they don't care about those things. Just be saying, would you go to church with you tonight? Or we had a 
campus class taught by the local preacher on Wednesday. Would you go to Bible class with me tonight? And I had that reputation to the point I came home from class one day and there stuck on my door in Elmer's glue was preacher. And I walked down to the room because I knew who did it. And I said, you know, sometimes I don't know how well I'm living the Christian life before you and an example before you. But by the sign you put on my door, I do. And thank you. I never had to remove it. I left to go to class, came back later, and it was gone. Until, and like I say, I, there's been times when I wished I'd thought more to say things like that when I didn't. But I know that's right. And I knew then what was right. And you know, when you're 72 and you're talking about what you were doing at 17, that is a while ago. I made those choices, brethren, a long time ago. And I will say, I don't mind saying, not because I did it, but why did I do it? What did I know about the Bible that said that I ought to do that? Was that just an invention of myself? Or did it have to do with what the Bible taught I ought to do and I must do and I can't wait on anybody else to do it? Where is the fervency? And when you see brethren sin, oh, well, you know, that's just the way it is. Is there no zeal? Is there no fervency? There must be a separation, and God expects that separation to be. Moses said, Fear ye not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. Exodus 14, 13. That's pretty adamant and pretty plain. The day had come when Israel would never again have to fear the Egyptians. And someday, maybe today, maybe tomorrow, someday I'll not have to be associated with people who hate God, who won't listen to the truth, and fickle, vacillating brethren who want to call themselves Christians and don't even half know what it means to be a Christian. I won't have to be around them anymore to vex me and aggravate me when I try to do what's right and speak the truth. Some people say, well, you've got to speak the truth in love. And you do. That's what Paul said. But they seem to think it's only in love with the people you speak it to. They don't realize speaking the truth in love means speaking the truth in the love of the truth. And the love of God whose truth you speak, as well as the people to whom you speak it. And I have the best example possible, of which there's no better example than Jesus Christ and how he approached everybody. And if that's too much for us, then look at the prophets and how they dealt with sin. And look at John the baptizer and how he dealt with it. Look at the early evangelist and how they dealt with it. They laid down their lives. You ever had to lay down your life for the Lord? You ever feared for your life because you taught the truth? Have you ever feared for your life because you came face to face with somebody and you told them what they had to hear and you did it with fear and trembling? Well, then you haven't been much of a Christian because they regularly did it. How do I know? Same way you can. Read your Bible. So we see then that these things will come to an end. Fifth, I think I'm at five, we learn that we cannot deliver ourselves. We cannot deliver ourselves. Some of us think we can. We may not articulate it and say really what's on our heart, but after all, we're trying to work all the time to have our own way about things, and that pretty much says you think you can. When really the Lord is saying, as the old song does, let him have his way with thee. Now, I can know whether I'm doing that or not. I can know whether his way is the greatest thing I seek after 
and I'm doing all I can to render obedience to his will every second of every day. Any problem that comes up, I know the Bible's there to solve the problems. It doesn't guarantee me that no problems will come up. It just says here's the solutions to them if you'll just listen. That sort of sounds like a father or mother talking to an errant child. If you just listen, that's the way we began this thing. That's what God's saying in the passage. If they would just listen, if they would just do it according to my way, salvation would be theirs. And as far as fleshly Israel is concerned, they could forever remain on the land. But of course, we know the story. They didn't. And God took them away. The strong arm of God was needed to deliver the children of Israel from the Egyptians. And in studying the Old Testament books and the historical section of the Old Testament, you see that Israel just did not learn to quit trying to find help from places like Egypt and other places. They wouldn't turn to God. Yet God's sending prophet after prophet after prophet. And as Stephen said, which of them have your fathers not killed and stoned? They just would not listen to God. Well, today, as we know, the saving power of God in Christ is through the gospel Romans 1.16, John 3.16. The Lord came to this world for one reason only, to seek and to save that which was lost, and lost in sin, Luke 19.10. Christ is able to save to the uttermost them that draw near unto him through him, that is, unto God through him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them, Hebrews 7.25. The Lord's not slack concerning his promise, which he means in his second coming, as some men count slackness. Well, then why hasn't he come? Why doesn't he come right now? And we don't know when he will. But he's waited 2,000 years so far, and we don't know how much longer he'll wait. But Peter tells us in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord's not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If we, if we use our time to do anything but to learn the will of God and come to repentance, we've failed the school of life. And we'll get an eternal elf at the judgment. The Israelites had to obey God when they left the land of Egypt. And today, all must obey God and flee worldly lust. Most of the New Testament, as you well know, was written to Christians about remaining faithful. So once you've obeyed the gospel, how wonderful that is, many never reach that stage. The majority won't reach that stage of obeying the gospel. But then there's all those other books saying, if you're in Christ, here's the way to be faithful. The gospel is truly God's saving power, Romans 1, 16. So when you look back at the passage that we started with. And I think it'd be good just simply to close now that we said these things by reading it again. Remember God's love. Remember how God bore with fleshly Israel. And remember how they constantly rejected him. Didn't pay attention to him. As the prophets would say of them, they're rebellious children. Know therefore this day and consider it in thine heart the Lord, He is God in heaven above and upon the earth beneath. There is none else. Thou shalt keep therefore His statutes and His commandments, which I command thee this day, that it may go well with thee and with thy children after thee, and that thou mayest prolong thy days upon the earth, which the Lord Thy God giveth thee forever. Do you know why you've been allowed to live as long as you've lived, whether that's short or longer than others? You just read it. In fleshly Israel, that they could live on the land, promised them as long as they were faithful. So what do we do with the time that God has given us? Once we become Christians... How much difference is there in us and the world? And sometimes I'm afraid it comes down to the fact that, well, the people of the world don't attend worship services. Other than that, there's not much difference. 
That's why we're taught to set our affections on things above, not on things on the earth. Because everything you can perceive through your five senses is going to disappear someday. This whole state of being is going to be gone. The elements will melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works of therein shall be burned up. You believe God on that? That's the end of it. So how should we live today? Developing a great love of God that sets aside everything else to obey His will and to teach others the truth and to contend for the faith. You have to apply these things in your own life where you are at this time and what you're doing or not doing. But it's still the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. If you're not a child of God, we've studied several times in this sermon how to become one. To be a Christian, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. A member of the church Jesus built and purchased with His blood. If you're baptized for the mission of your sins, the Bible tells us the Lord himself adds you to the church, Acts 2.47, Acts 2.38. As a child of God, you have to ask yourself honestly, am I here to serve God no matter what, to faithfully serve God, to keep his commandments, to teach the truth, to contend for the faith, to rear my children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, to be a husband and a wife like I ought to be, and anything else you can think of. The Bible furnishes us unto every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17. And we must study it. Or we don't profit from it. As a child of God, if you've sinned, why? And once you've decided you've sinned, just humble yourself in the mighty hand of God. Repent of those sins. Confess them and pray for forgiveness. Someday, we will see this world no more. Forever. So why fall in love with it? Would you come to Jesus if you need while we stand and sing?